Thank you so much for joining us, Manny Maceda. Truly a pleasure having you on ET Now. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mr. Maceda, you are probably the, the best person to ask this question because you consult companies all over the world and have uh, a very macro and a bird's eye view of, of the world. Sure. Uh, what would you say today would be the most worrying uh, and nightmarish uh, you know, uh, thoughts that go through a company's stock management today? I think the, I don't know that people are having nightmares yet. Uh, I would say uh, it, there is a healthy um, uh, level of anxiety, uh, resilience as you look at the world for the next uh, 20 years wow. compared to uh, what it was been for the vast majority of our business career. You know, we, the world uh, went through a, a period, we called it the great moderation, where everything was pretty stable capital abundance, stable politics, a growing workforce, obviously until, uh, until the global financial crisis. But uh, you, you almost had a predictable macroeconomic environment. Um, we would say if you look at the next 20 years, sure. or even start with the next 10 between now and uh, 20, 2030, okay. um, the, uh, the globalization is going to be different. The labor force dynamics are going to be very different. Uh, automation is going to uh, change the nature of jobs and roles. And so uh, that creates faster cycles mm. in how long companies succeed. Mm. Part of the reason our transformation practice, if you will, has grown so much in the last few years is when a company has a stable business model for a long time, you, you don't need to go through it. Well, the pace, yeah. because of all these forces, gets shorter and shorter. And so companies have to be more resilient. They have to deal with more volatile uh, environments. And, and obviously, everything in the news we've been dealing with the last few years uh, contributes to that. And obviously, there's much worse scenarios <laughs> that might be out there socially, um, um, you know, militarily. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that, that requires a planning perspective for companies that just has to take a wider range of scenarios into account. So if you, let's say, had to look at uh, you know what you were advising companies let's say 10 years ago and what you're advising companies now uh, what would be the key differences that you'd like to highlight I would say the core some of it hasn't changed that much but if you look at uh, strategic growth a decade ago um, uh, in in a world where people had seen long-term stability sure. When you're looking for a new engine of growth, you always started with, what do I do well now? What's a near adjacency that can build on it? And there's almost this natural you know, lockstep to, to continue to expand. Um, the pace now at which your existing core business could suddenly get disintermediated, um, your ability to uh, not just look for a second or third engine of growth, while engine one, the way we'd call it, the core engine continues, your engine one might be going away fast. Sure. You know, you're uh, you're getting disintermediated, and uh, and so the ability and so there's a lot more work we do now, which highly overlaps with digital, by the way, because that's one of the key enablers mm -hmm. or forces. Sure. Is well, how, how will our industry be disrupted? How will our business model be disrupted? Mm -hmm. Can can we future back? Sure. Uh, what'll happen? If you look at the automotive industry as an example, could we have predicted with foresight? that the two key words for that industry is electric and driverless. Sure. For an industry that was entirely built on a car was something a human being drove. Yeah. So for every industry, the equivalent of that um, is now part of the, the psyche and the strategic planning uh, anxiety of, uh, of senior teams. Sure, 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 sure. Um, you know, with uh, AI and automation and the entire conversation that's kind of trending globally where everybody's talking about uh, you know the future of jobs do you think this is uh, a valid concern that's uh, that's keeping a lot of people awake at night and do you think most of us are going to lose our jobs to machines <laughs> yes. uh, so do uh, you think this is a, a valid uh, concern that all of us must be preoccupied with or do you think uh, too much is made out of it I'd say uh it's a, a short answer. It's probably too much is made out of it in the short term. What but, is short term? Um, 
in the next three to five years. Okay, fair enough. Um, but if I look in the long term, it's meaningful. Now, why do I say that? Well, uh, productivity of our workforce enabled by technology is something that we've all been trying to do for many years. And uh, whether when I started uh, in my firm, it was having a nice HP 12C calculator. <laughs> um, but, but so, uh, and so as, as we want the world to grow and, and uh, the labor force is actually declining. India is one of the few countries left in the world that has a positive uh, um, we have, we have. You know, labor <laughs> forecast. Yeah. And so all of these technologies, the reason companies want to do it is to, is to increase productivity, right? It, it's not intrinsically a bad thing. Oh, to so you're actually saying it's advantage companies. Absolutely. Yeah. The, when when people are looking for uh, automation, there is generally a uh, there's generally a cost saving. Sure, sure. It's more efficient, which means the product gets to a lower price, and the consumer you know uh, is served by buying it. So uh, that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think the long term concern is that. Um, the, uh, the, the actual jobs that are getting created mm. by all of these new technologies are going to be less than the jobs that are getting eliminated. Um, and, uh, and, and that creates you know, a, a number of issues, and, and we, we see that. Uh, you know, for example, in, in uh, the, the cost, uh, the average cost of a cobot, we'd call it, uh, or a you know, collaborative robot uh, <laughs> in a manufacturing environment, is about um, four dollars an hour. In many developed markets, the cost of a manufacturing worker is forty dollars an hour. Mm. Um, in China, it's about two. In India, it's about one. But if you say, okay, I can replace uh, for the the, uh, the return on investment on making that uh, that automation, if, if you think of it in those terms and not in job terms, yeah. is a positive thing for productivity. Okay. The issue is is the long run, and that's just in a manufacturing context. And you're seeing this, the experience curve of these cobots go down. Uh, as recently as 2010, it was about a five-year um, uh, payback in China to replace a worker. Last year, it was about a year and a half. And uh, so if I look, I look going forward, and, and now if you look at many other industries, service industries, um, there is opportunity for uh, replacement. So a decade from now, uh, all of these uh, all of these things uh, now need to be taken into account in not just government policy but even company policy because uh, it's the <laughs> we're making these products more efficient mm -hmm. so that our consumers can buy them but our consumers need jobs sure, to sure. Uh, to be able to buy sure, them absolutely. So <laughs> uh, uh, but in the context of what you just told me yes. uh, and I want you to, you know, zone in on, let's say, the India market, right? Because we currently have a demographic dividend. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think going forward, this dividend is going to become a very big liability for the Indian market? You know, the, the short answer is I don't know. Fair enough. Uh, it uh, and and it's a question for me of time frame, um, at least from a near term or medium term planning horizon, three to five years. The fact that you have this demographic in a in a world where there is not that many other sources of labor growth. And historically, again, the last 50 years, labor growth contributes to GDP growth. You know, you have, so if, if you can take advantage of that and deploy them um, productively, um, while uh, you still have this large uh, domestic economy, you know, the, uh, the great dream of the, the, Indian, the Indian consumer that we can serve, you know, while, uh, while there is still a, uh, uh, a wage arbitrage in some parts of the business that still uh, makes it uh, less, uh, less cost effective here to, uh, to automate certain things. Sure. But also in other parts of the economy to actually... It might make uh, it more efficient, but, mm, yes. but uh, maybe not cost uh, efficient. Well, you'd still want the efficiency uh, because it'll stimulate demand, you know, and so these are all um, multiple forces. And and the one question I'd have is, as, as this happens, do you want, do you want those new jobs that are uh, that are part of the automation process to also stay here? You know, that that's part of the China strategy. As they automate their factories, well, who's who? Sh who should be making the robots? You know, who should be programming them? Who should be providing the artificial intelligence? If it's staying 
in China and they become a automation supplier to the world and it's net net positive and so the equivalent of that for uh, for an Indian labor strategy I think is something that's you know important to solve it's not going to be one size fits all sure. it's going to be you, you have this large labor force that probably needs multiple flavors of, uh, of job creation I'm glad you brought that up do you think in the context of what you just said, and looking at what China is doing right now, uh, with their whole, you know, transition to automation in a slow and steady manner, do you think uh, India has a recognized this as uh, as you know an an area which should be highlighted and focused on, given the fact that we are, you know, such a large population, and B, do you think we're giving enough thought and energy? to ensure that going forward, Indian tech and software companies uh, will be driving digital transformation aggressively, as aggressively as, let's say, their foreign counterparts, to ensure that you know, they remain on the right side of history. I would, I would hope so. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I think, uh, number one, that you, you, have, you have a tradition. You, you, you invented the IT services BPO industry, for example. That's, sure. That was the, maybe one of the first waves um, you created a, a set of companies that could operate uh, globally. I mean, e even today for our firm, one of the nice things that we love about this market is a big chunk of our workforce here serves other markets. Um, whether they stay here and, uh, and support our other markets analytically or whether given uh, the willingness to travel and the great English speaking skills, you can serve clients in the Middle East, in Singapore, and in, in the U.S. So I'd say here could could you do that? Could the IT services firms uh, continue to create the next waves of, mm. uh, of IT mm. technology that, that are built here? I'd say that that could and probably should be a priority. Okay. I'd also not forget that uh, back to the manufacturing wage arbitrage opportunity, you know, you, you have a large manufacturing base here too. Um, not as much as we should. You know, uh, I don't know if the, this, someone told me the other night here, you should tell me the facts that there's more uh, Indian billionaires created out the, the auto industry than the IT industry. <laughs> and again, because you have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of products that the, the Indian market uses, cars, motorcycles, for example, in, sure. in that industry. Yeah. And so could you continue? The, if I look at the China strategy that started with, we will be the low cost manufacturer of the world. Yeah. And, and it worked for them. It they, did, yep. And then says, now we want to go upscale, higher quality manufacturing. And if we're going to automate, we want to own the robots rather than buy them from Japan, sure. you know, which is getting actually a nice bump now from, from robotics. And then let's take advantage of all our new IT capability and the data that we're collecting from the great companies we helped foster and build, like Alibaba and Tencent, and actually make mm -hmm. You, you could see how each strategy built on it. Um, and so is there an element of that that's still use, useful here? I'd say the whole idea of not just made in India, but made in India for India uh, is, a, is a very important uh, component mm -hmm. on both the, uh, the traditional um, manufacturing and uh, you know, more mature industry side and all of the new IT technologies, because that's you, you don't you won't be able to get everyone <laughs> employed in in the ladder mr Masera, just like you you know gave us your global view of the China strategy as a country and what they're trying to do. Do you think India is clear in terms of how globally people are reading their strategy as a country? Do you think one has a read on that, if you, look, if you have an outside, inside view? I would say uh, I, I could look at it multiple ways. You know, one, ourselves, as a, as a, we're, a we're one of the ultimate global firms that, mm. yeah. uh, that uh, and as the chief executive of our firm, I interpret what's happening here. This is a fast-growing, important, there's a reason I'm here for my third time in eight or nine months, sure. 
it's the you know one of the fastest growing parts of our Asia Pacific business, which is the fastest region um, in uh, in all of Bain. Mm -hmm. um, if I look at it from the lens of how do both our corporate clients mm -hmm. as well as our investor clients, as you know, our firm does a lot of work with private equity firms. Yeah. Um, the short answer is yes. Actually, they view that uh, India, uh, the under the uh, under this government, uh, is uh, has a desire to make this an attractive place to invest. Okay. Um, and because of this, uh, and and because of the attractiveness of this, you know, this potential very large inside the country consumer base, coupled with the talent base here that can operate inside and outside India. Mm. Uh, there's a reason foreign direct investment in India is higher than many countries. And, uh, and so it's, relatively speaking, if you look at what's going on around the world, um, this is still considered, you know, a, a, a uh, priority of investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd, say I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to see the government continue to take advantage of that and, uh, and lean into that. But how would you define India's economy? Would you call us uh, um, a manufacturing economy, a, a, con a consuming economy? Because I'm always very confused with how we should define ourselves. And I'm also very confused about how companies that look at India and salivate because we're you know, so large uh, invest in the country. Because uh, while we might be 1.3 billion people, uh, very, I mean, be, our consuming population would be more accurately about 250 million, which is also significant. Yes. But uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm always confused about how companies are looking at, looking at us as a market and how we define define ourselves. I think that's uh, that's I think that's a reasonable that's a very reasonable observation because uh, it's complex. You know, it's 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 not a uh, it's not a country that you can just simply put in a box. Sure and say, you know, this was a manufacturing export economy, you know, like, uh, you know, like Japan in the 70s. Um, so it's, it's multifaceted, which is okay, because it's large. Um, it's as much service as it is manufacturing. Um, it has uh, successes in both. It's a little bit historically both export and, and domestic, and there's sort of this other subset in between export and domestic, by the way, which is the, uh, the Indian diaspora around the world. Sure. And so uh, you almost, uh, you know, consultants love this, you can almost frame this as sort of a, a matrix of, uh, of, of different kinds. It's export, import, um, semi-export, um, manufacturing, service, and the, re the reason it's attractive is is because we're all over the place? Well, because it's it, each individual cell by its own could be a, could be a great opportunity, right? The, uh, there's not that, uh, if I look at uh, global multinationals that operate in different countries, there's not that many countries left in the world. We, we, we just see this directly from our client base where they will want to do a study specifically for the domestic market sure. in this country. This is always one of them. Know, and and it's because that gap between the 250 you talked about and the rest of the population is, uh, you know, is out there. At the same mm. time, it has history that mm. says, you've been a great export company. You're you're creating global companies. You have strong national companies. If I look at our, so that makes it all of the above. You know, for for us in particular, the rise of successful Indian companies is a real marker um, for us okay. to care about a country. Because if a country is just a place where we do work for global multinationals, you know, we'll, we might open an office, but it's actually, um, it's not as interesting. It's not okay. as important for us. And uh, the fact that for us is almost a leading indicator, now we've built a very large business here where our primary client base are Indian companies. Um, you know, that, that for me is a sign that uh, these are companies that are succeeding mm domestically and then now even increasingly going uh, going abroad so yeah, sure. so I I didn't answer your direct uh -huh. question because I, I don't know that I could simply categorize this in one bucket you know you're a fair enough very difficult to read yeah, fair you're, enough you're like uh, uh, you're like a Picasso uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just wondering on another note completely uh, you know with all the, the the digital scandals that have come to the fore uh, <laughs> you know in the last 
year and a half, whether it be fake news or more recently the data breach uh, with Facebook. Uh, do you do you see that there is a consumer uh, trust deficit uh, that you're that you're seeing witnessing at all globally? And uh, if so, what is the kind of impact we're going to see uh, with large companies and large brands? You know, I would say that. Uh if anything, there was a consumer trust surplus for a long time. Okay. Um, you know, and uh, uh, you use the term scandal. The the challenge in some of these is, is a balance, and and for any of these companies between uh, um, regulation, in some cases, uh, given how fast they achieved, um, you know, a consolidation and yeah. and and real market power. In fact, most of these companies have. Um, have scaled up and created market positions that were in far of excess of how quickly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> regulatory forces could ca catch up to Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And as long as uh, you know, as long as they were fine, and 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 you know, trust. You said you said, consumer trust is a. Uh, it's an interesting thing. It takes a long time to build. It's easy to lose. Sure. And uh, and and you've you've seen with some with some tech platforms how fast. Um, a consumer can uh, can lose it. So I, I think, a they these companies have to be uh, extremely careful uh, in uh, in uh, their their search for next waves of growth, given how scale they've already become. Never to lose the consumer trust. And then, frankly, I think regulation, you know, has to catch up. Um, you know, in in the United States, for example, uh, there's many industries that an antitrust commission. Um, will will look at uh, will look at market power um, in some of these industries they became monopolies without ever having without people even understanding it sure. and, and so that's that those are just some of the dynamics that will happen uh, mr. Becerra, before I let you go uh, if, you, if I had to ask you and put you in the spot uh, you know in the spotlight and ask you give me one uh, case study that is so close to your heart that is very, it's very significant, telling, and critical in terms of uh, you know a global standpoint. Or which one would it be? And I hope you'd care to share. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, you know we uh, um, we we are very uh, we respect our clients' uh, privacy, uh, privacy, yeah. and so yeah. uh, with, without uh, names, I'll just say from a from a transformation standpoint, um, when it all comes together. So I've uh, and I've had a chance to work with uh, quite a few companies sure. over the years. You know, um, many were founders actually. Um, so the one I'm thinking about is it's it's a global brand. It has it, its business matured, and uh, and suddenly uh, it, you know it needed an entirely new engine. Um, and so a combination of building new capabilities that uh, new product lines that it had for it's in it's in tech, it's in technology, it's in hardware. Um, actually, having the company go private because often to go through a transformation, sometimes you need a capital structure change. Sure. You know, public shareholders uh, will often require short-term returns on theirs, and often you have to do that. Uh, that meant you need it to be, and it's a company that had to go very digital, has to build new capabilities. So you think if you look at every single box, and now it's come out the other side as a, you know, as a leader. In, in its space, but it's very different mm. from uh, from what it was as recently as five years ago. Um, you know, I can I can look and this is yeah. You know, uh, we we partnered with them and transformed them every way you can think of, and so that's that's close to my heart. If we can do uh, if we can do many more of those, I think my firm will be doing fine. On that note, thank you so much, Mr. Becerra. Truly a pleasure once again uh, having you on ET Now and have a wonderful trip in India. Thanks so much, Sonali.